I'm Elaine Petricelli, and it's my joy to be here tonight to introduce these two amazing people. Um, I, we, Valerie and Gavin have given us permission to do a video of tonight's event, and so it will go up on our website, bookpassage.com, and you should watch bookpassage.com because there are all kinds of amazing author interviews there. It's also the place where you could uh, shop online <laughs> instead of some other place that doesn't <laughs> contribute to your community. <laughs> and for those of you who really love ebooks, uh, I am not angry at you. It is okay. Uh, especially if you have anything but that one that starts with a K, because we sell ebooks on all our website, as do almost all independents, and we're uh, delighted to that we can do that. Uh, I personally still like real books, but I understand that not everybody can. As some of our teenagers tell us they don't like ebooks, but their grandmothers do because the print is large. <laughs> I'm a grandma, so I understand you. Uh, so thank you for being with us. We are so lucky tonight because our <coughs> friend, amazing writer, fabulous person, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom has agreed to be with us tonight to be in conversation with Valerie Plain on stage. And uh, I don't, if you didn't see Gavin Newsom when he was speaking at Dominican, go to bookpassage.com and you can see it, but you'll get a taste of it tonight. And if you haven't read Citizenville and you are thinking about all that's going on in the world today, particularly our country, and how powerless a lot of citizens feel, read Citizenville and get to work. You will see all kinds of new ways that we can make things happen. Uh, as you know, he is not a man who doesn't let make things happen. Uh, gay marriage, done. <laughs> we are so proud of him. And although we live in Marin, um, how many of you live in San Francisco? Lucky people, you have health care. And we're, we're getting it too, but a little later. Uh, Valerie Flynn is one of our heroes. <coughs> we have we watched the news unfold as this person whom we had never heard of suddenly became very, very famous. Um, my husband and I have been married almost 40 years and I noticed that he would always uh, look up and watch carefully whenever Valerie <laughs> was on. <laughs> was because she is a true heroine and a great <laughs> But a couple of years ago, when Fair Game was published, her publisher, Simon & Schuster at that time, had a fancy party at the top of the rock. And my husband was invited and he was so excited because when he got there, Valerie Plain was standing there and he was talking to her and he got the impression that he was going to get to sit next to her at dinner. <laughs> Maybe he'd have a drink. I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't drink that much. But it came time for dinner, and someone came and whisked Valerie away uh, to sit with someone else, and he got to sit between Mary Madeline and Lynn Cheney. <laughs> We have Valerie playing here tonight, and I have to tell you that you are in for such a treat, because Blowback is an absolutely fabulous thriller that you won't, don't read it before you go to bed, you won't sleep, but the protagonist, Vanessa Pearson, I think it's a coincidence, the initials, uh, she is fantastic, and I am hoping that we are going to see her in many books because I think she is amazing. I have never seen a character like Vanessa. Uh, maybe we're going to see one like that right here tonight. So thank you, Gavin and Valerie. For being here.
you, everybody. Thank you for the warm applause. And what a treat uh, to have Valerie here to talk about this book. Valerie, that's getting an unbelievable amount of good press. Your first Woo! fiction novel. Yes. What were you thinking? Fiction. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having us here. Thank you for coming, Gavin. It My means pleasure. a lot. Uh, there are some great uh, friends and some family in the audience. I appreciate you coming this evening. This is really special. Uh, so I wrote Fair Game, a memoir, which is really more, in many ways, a catharsis of what mm -hmm. I went through. And uh, there was a movie. And then when that was done, my uh, publisher, David Rosenthal, who was with uh, who was Simon and Schuster had moved over to Penguin, and he suggested, well, what about doing something fiction, a spy thriller? And uh, I will tell you, this has been a lot more fun to do, <laughs> to write <laughs> and to talk about, because there was so much partisan uh, intensity around Fair Game, and this is this is fun, and it's a great story. So I mean, literally, this came about through that conversation. This was not sort of always something pent-up desire to get in the no, fiction No, up, up until this point, I've only written Intel reports or, you no, know, that's and right. so um, I have a co-author, our, our publisher, this David Rosenthal, sort of acted as a matchmaker, and she, her name is Sarah Lovett, and she is a thriller writer, and she really understands... She's done, what, five books? Though. Yeah, uh, and so, she, and she lives in New Mexico as well, so he put us together, and she really understands the craft of writing, how to pace things, how to what to cut out, and hopefully I bring to it my uh, my experience. It's informed by my time at the CIA, and I wanted very much to have a much more realistic female protagonist. Right in a world where there's not enough female protagonists. Period. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> true. Uh, so the initials are the same little bio background, your father was in the Air Force, uh, Vanessa's father was in the Air Force, your father served in World War II, Vanessa's father served in Vietnam, major distinction. Uh, your brother in the Marines, Vanessa's brother in the Marines, again, all coincidence. Crazy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Fiction. Fiction. Well, uh, just to be clear, uh, this book, As Fair Game, did go through a pre-publication review by the CIA. When you join the CIA, you are obligated to find a, sign a secrecy agreement in which you say you promise not to reveal classified information or reveal sources and methods, which I completely understand and support. Okay. Uh, so everything I do needs to go through their review. And they understood that this was fictionalized, uh, but even so I was able to, I, it was important to me that the trade craft was more accurate than what you see. You know, every time you see on TV, Homeland or anything else, or in the movies where they have cell phones inside CIA headquarters, doesn't happen. Okay, um, those are like little transmitters that you carry with you, uh, and a lot of other in, in terms of the trade craft, how you move in and out of countries, how you work with aliases, uh, how you communicate with an asset clandestinely and the relationships. Uh, so I tried to make that part as realistic as possible, and uh, happily the agency understood that I wasn't revealing any classified information, so no redactions. Yeah, and, and in any way, and how many of you have read Fair Game or know about, I mean, sort of infamous, so mostly, I mean, infamously, the book is redacted, things that seem, you know, pretty benign that you could communicate. So in this case, there's none of that. But was there, I mean, were there edits that they encouraged uh, or compelled you to make uh, in some of the pre-drafts? Uh, no, I would, I would say as a former professional intelligence officer, I fully understand what is classified and what is not. But you, it is a, uh, I'm sure this is being, going to be reviewed, as we know, probably reviewed by the NSA in no time. But um, what they, it is very the conversations much, being recorded. Exactly. <laughs> It's very much an arbitrary process. What happened with Fair Game, uh, I dare say, had a lot to do with political machinations. Uh, and it was, the, the agency has uh, made it clear that I cannot acknowledge any agency affiliation prior 
to 2002. So I guess I just sort of fell from the sky. But anyway, so that's, it has nothing to do, all those redactions had nothing to do with protecting national security. It's a fact that apparently I may have existed, right, yeah. Um, so this didn't have any of that, and yet I could still, the central premise revolves around uh, a secret Iranian nuclear facility, which as we know is very much in the headlines right now. Yeah, fiction. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, in some cases, when Sarah and I were working, we couldn't get ahead of the headlines. You know, uh, we, we would uh, talk about a plot point where uh, uh, an Iranian scientist gets assassinated, and sure enough, in the papers the next day. Uh, I just saw there's been I just saw the other day where the head of the Iranian cybersecurity shot dead in the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you. Can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, let, let's, uh, we'll unpack a few things, but just a little bio. I mean, everyone feels like they know you because in 2003, uh, overnight, you became part of our conversation. Uh, and all of you, I think, recall rather intimately the circumstances that led to that, and, and perhaps you can amplify them if you wish. Uh, but you spent how many years in the CIA? I mean, obviously, you spent no time before 2002. Uh, so, uh, that's more a fiction question. How would you answer? Yeah. I hypothetically. Yeah, hypothetically. Yeah. 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 I, I think what I can say is I, I'm safe to say I love my career. Yes. Um, and I, as you noted, I come from a family where public service was considered something that was worthwhile. I mean, my, my father fought in, in the South Pacific in World War II. He was with the Air, an Air Force officer. My brother served as a Marine in Vietnam and was wounded. My mother was a public school teacher. So when I was given this opportunity to join the CIA, I just thought it was something that sounded like a lot more interesting than what my friends were doing. And that, uh, <laughs> you know, how great, how great the government was going to pay me to live and work overseas. Was, <laughs> is this, I mean, is there the romance? Was this someone just tapping you on the shoulder and saying, please come here in a back alley, I've got a job for you. Or could you go out and seek it and go through dry interviews and long process of testing and then a lot of interviews of your neighbors to determine if you could be trusted? What I can say... But how say, do you become a CIA? Uh, well, uh, it's a really... It, it's, a, it's a long process. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. Uh, I remember I took all kinds of psychological examinations and interviews uh, multiple choice, and of which is a lot of that is a blur. Except to this day, I still remember uh, one of the questions on this a multiple choice test that I took, and the question was, "Do you like tall women?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did you respond? I know. I know. Everything hangs in the balance. <laughs> Yes, you do. A, there's an extremely thorough uh, background check, psychological, medical, all of that. I mean, it, you go through a lot of hoops, and uh, and then even then, when you're done, you and you have a job, uh, you go. I went through paramilitary training at the farm. I did operational training, and they're constantly evaluating you and testing you. And uh, so, by the time you finally get out in the field. Uh, you're like, well, can I actually do this? You know, yeah, because yeah, it's been a long road to get to that point. But it's not as romantic. I mean, I guess that's what you were trying to convey here, that it's not, though, this is spicy, let's be honest, uh, the book. I mean, high-speed chases, bullets flying by. But my uh, husband made sure there oh, wasn't a lot of sex. No, <laughs> no, but there but there's, you know, like, I mean, where, where, where is this coming from? Yeah, well, I mean, you would <laughs> I think you called the CIA one of the greatest dating agencies in the world. Yeah. For a reason, right? Yeah, for a reason. Uh, I think it's probably like uh, two actors on a set, that you come from a pretty insular, uh, unusual world, and uh, it's just easier when you are dating someone or involved with someone that you can speak to in, in shorthand. Uh, I mean, there's... Of course, in, in real life, there's a lot of waiting around and a lot of boring parts and a lot of bureaucracy, which is why if you go into operations, you very much want to be in the field as far as way as possible from that bureaucracy. <laughs> um, but you can't, you can't put the boring parts in a book or other people right, put no, it no, down. No, no. So right. 
Yes, we you know sat around and had another cigarette and another right. drink yeah. while you're waiting yeah. for you know. And there's a lot of. And it seems like in here you're only in you know exotic locations. I imagine in real life you you're not always in Vienna or, or Cyprus. No. Uh, you're not in you know I don't know. For Stad or something. And then that, well, I know uh, that's not in here, but I you know I would like to say Stad. Uh, the G, the G, yeah, the G, the G, the G. Um, <laughs> no, for me, anywhere uh, traveling is always exotic. You know, I, I'm so interested in people, just people watching and all of that. But all the places in the book, whether it's uh, Prague or Vienna, or London, uh, Nicosia, I've been to all of them. I've either worked there or played there or traveled through there. So. Uh, again, I wanted to make it uh, more realistic. It still has to be entertaining, but more realistic. So let's talk about the book itself. It opens up, set the scene, Vienna. You are, well, no, someone by the initials VP, um, <laughs> Vanessa Pearson, is on the hunt, this cat and mouse game, going after one of the most feared, one of the most uh, successful, what? He is a nuclear black market arms dealer. By the name of? Boots. Boots. Yeah, uh, which is uh, actually um, uh, Hindi for ghost. And uh, it was ins he is inspired by A.Q. Khan, if any of you know who that is. He is an uh, infamous Pakistani nuclear scientist, now more or less under house arrest in Pakistan. But for many, many years, he sold nuclear technology and widgets to anyone uh, that had the money. I mean, he, he is amoral. So this character, this villain, uh, is based on that. And you know, finding out what's behind it, what are the motivations. Uh, the opening scene is Vanessa meeting an Iranian a scientist who has managed to come out of Iran after two years. They haven't met for a few years. Uh, he has come out for a conference, and they are to meet uh, in Prater Garden. And he's late, which happens a lot because agency combo plans, communication plans get screwed up all the time, but it gets your adrenaline really going. Yeah. And finally, he shows up, and he is about to tell her the uh, geo coordinates of where this secret, suspected but not yet known, secret Iranian nuclear facility is located in the vast, vast territory of southeast Iran. And uh, just as he begins to tell her, he's assassinated in front of her. And I never lost an asset in front of me, in, like, you know, ever, I'm happy to say. But uh, she does, and then it goes from there. And whew, pretty good, right? <laughs> Good enough to, to buy the book. Uh, I hope so. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you talk, I mean, how, did you travel to most of these locales? I mean, what was the, let me step back. What was the collaborative experience, sitting down with Sarah? How did you begin to map out the storyline here, this narrative? Did you have a strong sense of, of that opening scene when you sat down? with your collaborator, or did that work out as she sort of interviewed you about your experiences, about the locations and the flavor of the work that you may have been doing uh, over I, the years? I would say in my head I had a really strong sense of where I wanted to build the story. I knew the characters. I've met so many interesting people along the way, and I just, you know, and, and Com pulling them, yeah, pull them in. Uh, and the places and the issue, which I still care about passionately, is nuclear proliferation and what it means, particularly in the hands of terrorists. So uh, though, the, a lot of those strong elements were there. Uh, Sarah is uh, also a working mother, so we are very forgiving of each other uh, and schedules, you know, at, at, uh, lots of flexibility there. Uh, but I, I knew what I, I knew what I wanted, and I, it was. As I have I said a little bit before, uh, a lot of it comes out of my own disgust, really, at how female CIA ops officers are usually portrayed. Highly sexualized, too physical, or too reliant on guns. You know, that's not how you collect intelligence. Or they're, they're just such cardboard characters, in, in, in my yeah. uh, estimation. And even 
I'm asked a lot about Homeland, great TV, Claire Danes is a fabulous actress, but it is really unrealistic. <laughs> has, has anyone noticed that she doesn't have any friends? <laughs> she has jazz. Um, and that's not really, uh, you know, uh, it's helpful to have good interpersonal skills if you're going to be in human intelligence. <laughs> I mean, Homeland, how many of you watch Homeland? I imagine most, right? I mean, it's addictive. What is it? Why? What, what is it about spycraft? What is it about your own um, intrigue, your own desire to be in the CIA? Is it just public service? Or is this a fantasy world? Uh, is it sort of that, you know, we're sort of unveiling uh, the world? I mean, is this... You know, people put themselves in the character and wish they were living that life. Yeah. As opposed to our mundane lives, day in and day out, that's, picking up the kids and that's, de that's definitely a part of it. I think uh, the, the success of James Bond, first, first in the Ian Fleming novels and then in the movies, where, you know, you get to do that armchair travel. No one goes to see James Bond for the dialogue. Uh, <laughs> but there, there is you know, that sense of glamour and romance and all that that's very attractive. But lately, my, my own hypothesis, and that's all it is, just my opinion, that there is a certain fascination with that world because, and we can talk about the NSA, but because we have, we are now living in a, in a day and a time where there is so much information that we give up voluntarily about ourselves. And the notion that someone would actually <laughs> be discreet and more private and maybe not tell you everything is is so different than what you see now. I mean, as we all know, there's just way too much oversharing, right? Um, and I think maybe that's a piece of it. Don't you think? No, I, I, I'm asking the questions. <laughs> you, I saw you in an interview the other day. You said, I mean, in, in terms of attributes, you make the case that you know, just someone that shoots. Uh, everything in sight or someone that doesn't have any interpersonal relationships it's not going to be very good at intelligence gathering and you were asked the other morning I saw CBS uh, morning uh, with Charlie Rose and others you you responded by saying the most important attribute is curiosity curiosity yeah I mean everyone has a story everyone has a story <laughs> and I think that genuine desire to know that about someone else comes across and it's really helpful when you are, when you want to understand what someone's motivations might be, or what their frame of reference are, and how would you, why would they possibly ever want to uh, collaborate with U.S. intelligence to provide that sort of thing? And so that's, I think it starts there. I mean, other things are really important too, but it starts with that—that that you genuinely care about. What's going on and with someone? You're just curious. Is that now more important in a world that's been hyper-connected and tools of technology, and all of the, the you know, sort of the, the big data world? Is that human, that interpersonal kind of work now more important than ever as it relates to um, the work done today uh, with the CIA and other agencies? Absolutely. I, mean, I have a bias because I came up through the world and my focus has always been on human intelligence. Uh, but, you know, all the overhead satellite imagery in the world and all the uh, electronic communications that you might collect about someone will not ultimately tell you what their intent is. You could see, say in a, in a satellite photo, you could see tr uh, tanks massing on the border, a border somewhere, and unless you have someone who, has, who is inside the inner circle of the regime, to tell you what's going to happen with those tanks. It doesn't mean, you know. And I, I'm really heartened very much by this opening diplomatic window that we have with Iran. And that is, I applaud that. Uh, but at the same time, what, what runs parallel to that and what complements it is intelligence. Because as they go to the table next week in Geneva, um, I think it'll be uh, Secretary of State Kerry and, and his counterparts to see if there is any progress to be made on the Iranian nuclear issue. So they're they're doing what they need to do as diplomats, but on their side and on our side, that hopefully will be 
thoroughly supplemented and complemented by intelligence, which is important because each side then gets to calculate how far to push, where they know you, you, can't, you can't go any further than that. And I mean, in, in, until we're in a world where everyone's holding hands, and singing, right. it's important. Candles. Um, uh, what, I mean, well, you know, let, me, let me check. You, you did a documentary not too long ago, um, and you were pretty emphatic in there about mm -hmm. Iran's nuclear ambitions, making it, from your perspective, crystal clear that theirs is a militarization of the technology as opposed to domestic energy use and the like. Um, and that a lot of their assets are being organized in very urbanized areas underground, very strategically placed. So you open the door to Rouhani's recent comments. Uh, do you believe the sincerity of it? What's, I mean, from the perspective of the work you've been doing for many, many years on this, post even your time at the CIA, uh, are you optimistic uh, that there's a real opportunity here for constructive dialogue or do you think it's a delaying tactic? Uh, or do you feel it's, uh, it, it's sort of a hopeless journey of, of diplomatic engagement? No, never. I'm always optimistic, particularly since we haven't had diplomatic talks at this level since the revolution, over 30 years. Yeah. And you know with your own friends, if you haven't spoken to them in a few weeks or a few months or even a few years, the propensity for misunderstanding and miscommunication goes up uh, increases substantially and it's the same thing with nation states uh, that I, I don't understand uh, why we haven't been speaking to them because diplomatic relations are not to be bestowed as a favor uh, it, it is in our national interest and I think America is great enough that we speak both with our friends and our enemies so while President Reagan famously said trust but verify and it is, there is no doubt that Iran has sought a nuclear program rather than just peaceful use of, for energy use. Um, I think there is a moment here. There, there was, we know now, after 9-11, there were some overtures made in, toward the Bush administration, um, and there was some, some cooperation uh, in, around the Iraq war and so forth because, of course, that was... In, in their favor, but we we did not allow any real dialogue to begin. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic, and you know, any guy who tweets "Happy Rosh Hashanah" yeah. to my Jewish friends, yeah. Yeah. You, that's a change of change of tone. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> I'm do you I mean? Uh, do you do you lose more sleep over a nuclear Iran? Uh, North Korea yeah. or Pakistan? I lose the most sleep over Pakistan and I will tell you why. Um, Iran is not a suicidal nation. If anyone knows any Persians, they are ex extraordinarily proud as they should be of thousands of years of culture. Uh, they want to rejoin the community of nations. But these sanctions are, are biting. Although, as an aside, did you see uh, uh, Netanyahu had commented about, well, you know, in Iran they're not allowed to wear jeans even, and immediately he was besieged by like, you know, tens of thousands of tweets of Iranians wearing jeans. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's one. Uh, North Korea is a, a cult masquerading as a state. Uh, that is, I know it's, it's not really meant as a punchline, but it's true. Yeah. It's really scary. Um, but for my money, it's Pakistan because uh, it is an, the state is imploding. It is imploding. We know that their security services are deeply infiltrated by Al Qaeda, and their command and control functions on their nuclear nuclear arsenal is really um, shaky. So it, 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 it's scary. What did you think of? I think a lot of us watched Dick Cheney. Cheney. Is that, is that what Chris Matthews called him? <laughs> Dick Cheney, not following Matthews. Uh, when he was on Fox calling Snowden a traitor in response to a question, the irony of that yeah. with your personal experience.
uh, wrote a piece actually for The Guardian, and I couldn't resist putting a line that, you know, that's really just, the irony is, is too much to take. Um, on Snowden, ultimately he, he is irrelevant to the issue. Um, he is a sideshow. Uh, history will ultimately judge whether he is a hero, whether he is a traitor. The real issue at hand is this appropriate balance between security and privacy. Uh, I love that President Obama spoke about, well, we need to have a robust conversation on this. But of course, we never would have had that conversation without Snowden's revelations. Uh, so I'm, I'm following this very closely as more revelations continue to unfold almost on a weekly basis. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I am profoundly concerned uh, of how deep, and we're finding out just how e extensive it is, and in many cases, you know, the, the use of this secret FISA court uh, to, to do things that we as Americans don't fully uh, appreciate how this is going to impact us needs to be visited. When I think about that, you know, considering where you were standing, the work you were doing from an inside perspective, it, it, it seems remarkable to me how little people know, even within these agencies, about what these agencies are actually doing. Mm -hmm. Is that an overstatement? I mean, for you to say you're surprised, and you know more than 99.9% .9 of us combined, is an alarming fact. I think since 9-11, the, the boom, the billions of dollars that we have spent on mm -hmm. under the rubric of Homeland Security, and I call it the military industrial now intelligence complex, mm -hmm. is astonishing. Uh, I would recommend to you Dana Priest's book, Top Secret America, which came out about two years ago, and I was I was riveted to it, but no one really seemed to pay it much mind. Now I was just, and it talks about the explosive growth, for instance, in Washington, millions of square feet of office space that have gone up in the decades since not you know, since the attacks. Uh, I was just in Washington D.C. last week, and as I go a couple times a year. It is amazing to see the money that is there. It is a fountain of money. Uh, that, you know, dollars are practically raining out of the sky because of the contractors, which mm -hmm. is in the intelligence business about 60 to 70 percent of the budget. I could have a whole conversation about that, but I'll put that aside. And that's, but it's important. 60 to 70 percent of our assets in the intelligence community are privatized. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we have been told now. For uh, it's it really probably since Reagan, uh, the Reagan era, that private everything in the private sector is more effective and efficient and cost less, and really that's the way to go. Um, in some cases, that is true, but I will tell you for sure it is not more cost effective. Uh, Pogo, which is what Project on Oversight for Governments, yeah, or right. um, anyway, a respected group just put out a uh, a report taking a really deep dive at looking at the cost of DOD, Department of Defense contractors, they cost three times the amount of if there was a, a government employee doing the same job. So it's not more cost effective. I mean, we can have, there is a place for contractors, but uh, I, it has grown so vast, there is no one person that can get their arms around everything that is passing through there. And I just read uh, yesterday, interesting piece, I gotta go back and, and read it more carefully. So last week, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, was before Congress ringing the bell saying these government furloughs are, are so dangerous that they are endangering our national security because of the furloughed workers and so forth. To be expected, of course. You know, you're head of bureaucracy. Of course, you want more people and more money, and that's just normal. But honestly, I think it has gotten too big. Um, bigger is not always better. There is so much information. There are so many databases, and what's happening now? Everything is becoming stovepiped again. Remember, after 9/11, it was supposed to be more collaborative, but it, it's not because there is so much information. Um, I mean, they had to build, how big is that Utah data center? Yeah. You know, for the NSA? That's, it is vast. 
And uh, all that information, uh, the head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander, his motto is collect it all. Um, and does that necessarily keep us safer is the question that we as Americans should be asking. And you've also expressed concern about this, when I mean, you talk about this sort of the di dialectic between our security and, and, and the concerns around privacy and the, the friction uh, between those twin goals. Uh, and the example of S Snowden, obviously Manning, WikiLeaks, everything else. Uh, but you made an interesting point. There's over one plus million uh, people with top secret clearance. One million plus people with top and secret And they're surprised that there's a And they're surprised that there's a leak. Yeah. <laughs> In the case of Bradley Manning, what is a tw at the time a 22-year-old um, private yeah. doing with access that he had? Uh, I, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not supporting what he did, and there was a whole other conversation to be had on WikiLeaks. Nevertheless, the onus is on government. The, uh, to be able to say who should have that information, what is classified, because of course it's so much easier to overclassify everything, right? I mean, because then you, it, uh, it has the advantage of you don't actually have to think about it. Well, should this be classified or not? No, it's just all classified. Um, and so we're getting to the point where when everything's classified, nothing is secret, right? I mean, we used to joke during the CIA, if you really wanted to keep a secret, you would send a cable uh, routine precedence rather than yeah. priority yeah. for meeting. Because, you know, you get a meeting, everyone's like looking at your business and reading it, and I want to be in on that bigot list. And if you send a routine, it's, you know, gone. So that's... Do you miss your time in the CIA? Honestly. I do. Really I do. Miss. I really do. I mean, if, if none of this had happened, I would be overseas now. I would be doing what I, I really found a great sense of satisfaction doing, the proliferation stuff. Um, but it didn't, you know, it didn't turn out that way. So we live in New Mexico now, and we rebuild our lives. Uh, and you moved, uh, you moved to New Mexico with intention after uh, the chaos that ensued. Yeah, we moved in 2007. Uh, so let me let me tell you about the two weeks right before I left for New Mexico. So this is, uh, I think, a Wednesday in March, mid March. 2007, Scooter Libby was convicted on four out of five counts. Um, and then... But, but not for leaking your name. No. Which is an extraordinary thing. No. Uh, yeah. the, the, the Intelligence Identities Protection Act is poorly written, but that's, yeah. and that's a whole other thing, something else. So the following week, uh, Joe took our children who were young, seven years old then, and took them with some friends. So on Monday, I, we had sold our house, so I cleaned, why I didn't hire a cleaning lady? I cleaned the house, top to bottom. I closed on the house the next day, uh, which is, you know, like you sign 5,000 papers. Wednesday, I appeared before Congress to testify, and then Wednesday, uh, Thursday, I got on an airplane. So it was a big week. Rebuilt your life. Uh, you've been played in the movies by, uh, you know, not so bad actress. Uh, you had a wild success with Fair Game. Uh, now you're a successful novelist. I imagine this is not the end of your writing. I imagine there must be a follow up to Blowback already in the works. Yeah. <laughs> Do tell. Yes, uh, Sarah and I are working on the second one now, uh, which honestly it's going to be even better because I feel like, oh, I get it now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm like getting the, I'm getting the hang of it, um, and hopefully it's a long series. Uh, and it's it's been enjoyable and fun, and I figure y'all need something to read while we wait for the government to read. <laughs> For you, is this replaying what you hoped your career would look like? Uh, is it making up, I, I think you've even heard you say, sort of the fiction allows you to sort of uh, make up for your past mistakes. Uh, what, I mean, what, when we're reading 
uh, about Vanessa. What what should we be reading in to what you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's her. The love interest is someone she met at the farm. He's an inside officer, and because she's an outside officer, uh, they should really not be together because obviously it would compromise their respective covers. Uh, so he's, uh, he was born in Lebanon. His parents came to the States to uh, get away from the Lebanese Civil War. He went to Harvard. And in many ways, he's sort of the all-American boy, but he's not. And the very reason that the CIA hires him, not only for his linguistic skills, but who, you know, what he, how who he is, the, those same reasons put him under deep suspicion. Um, and actually, uh, that, so he's a composite <coughs> character. I saw a couple of, of I saw a little bit of that. Um, so that is part of it. Uh, and also the whole issue of the nexus of terrorism and nuclear proliferation. I want people, people to pay attention. Are you more uneasy about the world we're living in than you were 10 years ago in terms of that issue? I'm sorry to say yes, because uh, when you had, in the Cold War, it was a bipolar world, of course. Russia and the United States still have, but they had the preponderance of nuclear weapons, but there was the mutually assured destruction, the MAD doctrine, which I gotta love that acronym. Um, uh, but what you have seen, and what happened with it, when the Berlin Wall fell, the Cold War was over, there was sort of a collective sigh of relief. Oh, we don't have to worry about that anymore, right? Um, and it was an issue that went away, first in the euphoria of having won the Cold War and the, uh, you know, all the money that we would have that we didn't have to put into, the def uh, into defense and so forth. And what was happening in the 90s uh, was, of course, a steady increase in terrorism. Uh, in the mid-90s, if, if anyone remembers, there was a sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway, mm -hmm. and that was the first time that mm -hmm. the U.S. government sort of sat up and took notice of this issue of WMD as a transnational issue. Uh, and that's when, in the CIA, they set up the division where I work, counterproliferation division. And what also happened simultaneously is uh, uh, nuclear technology has spread, uh, not least because of AQ Khan, but in a great deal due to him. And so we are now where, uh, you mentioned this documentary, it's called Countdown to Zero, and it was in part produced by a group that I'm involved with, Global Zero, and it gives uh, so many <coughs> incidents where we came so close through, of course, we're, we're humans. We make mistakes and there's miscalculations. And I think that so far we have just been lucky, which is why I think, you know, you have to drain the swamp. We cannot continue the way we are going. And do you think we, has there been a marked departure from past practices of the Bush administration and the Obama administration? Can uh, sort of segue to you, we can't continue yeah. down the path we're going? Well, I think it's really notable President Obama's first foreign policy remarks in his presidency were in April 2009 in Praga, and he, sp he spoke about this. This is his personal, something he feels about uh, deeply for his own agenda. Now, obviously, he's got a really big to-do list. He's got a lot going on, but you know he's thinking about his legacy. And this is something that he has, as well as the president of Russia, Medvedev, have both publicly declared that this is where we'd like to go. We'd like to take uh, our nuclear uh, arsenal off hair trigger alert. Uh, we can continue to reduce our arsenals. No one is suggesting that this is going to be done unilaterally. No one's suggesting it's going to be done on Tuesday. But it is something to work toward. I mean, I, I think that's, you have to put a goal out there, right? Uh, and, it, and what we saw in Syria in August, it was so horrifying, those pictures, of course. Uh, and there is a reason that chemical weapons are so taboo, because they, like biological and like nuclear weapons, are completely indiscriminate. 
They kill women and children and innocents as well as soldiers on the battlefield. And that's why they go in a different category. Um, we have taken uh, quite a few steps. It was um, under Nixon, actually, that we signed the Chemical Treaty, uh, Chemical Warfare Treaty. Uh, Syria is getting on board. Uh, so I, I am hopeful uh, because I think nations are beginning to realize that nuclear weapons do not keep you safe. It didn't prevent what happened in Syria. It didn't prevent what happened in Boston. Um, these are weapons that belong, you know, in the 20th century. Amen. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, but think about yours. <laughs> um, and this is a, a simple question, and I imagine based on what you said, I, I, I can already sense an answer. But you've got two wonderful, beautiful young kids. Is this a world in terms of a career? that you would encourage them to enter into? I would. Uh, when I speak with students at universities, uh, both my husband and I, we always encourage the student population to consider a career in public service. It doesn't have to be the CIA, but uh, we really need the best and the brightest to consider a career. And I know from your book and what you are all about is engagement in our democracy. So whether that's sitting on your local library board or stuffing envelopes for a candidate that you believe in, wherever that is, it's about being engaged. Absolutely. And I, uh, my kids are 13, so you know who knows. But um, you don't you don't know what the input you know you know what the input is. You're not quite sure how it gets mixed up and what what they will ultimately do. But uh, I would be thrilled if they wanted to go into Even some sort of Even with all the service. experiences you had, all yeah. of the letdowns of folks that you trusted, things that happened to you, you can't even imagine what happened to any other American uh, <laughs> under those circumstances. Joe and I are still believers in the, in, uh, the system of justice. Uh, and it did, it, it, we did have the ultimate effect that we would have liked, but the wheels did start going around. When my, when my covert CIA identity was betrayed, the CIA referred it to the Department of Justice, and it, it did go through. I mean, we, we are, in, it, just watch the news now, it, it appears that the wheels are coming off right now. It feels really bad. As I said, I was in Washington last week, the environment there is so, the vitriol, it just doesn't feel good. Uh, so I, I hope that this is just a rough patch, but it's critical that our citizens, which is what you talk about in your book, to be engaged, pay attention, educate yourself, and figure out how, what do you do, what do you bring to the table, because otherwise you're just taking a perfectly good space. Yeah. Justice Brandeis said it beautifully, said, in a democracy, the most important office, in a democracy, the most important office is the office of citizen. We've kind of lost that. We allow the government to do things to us, and we're not co-creators in the life of our city, our state, our nation. So I, I certainly appreciate and parrot that. So what's on your mind? All right, I'm in trouble. There's too many of you. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we start here, since um, we have a gender bias. Um, it is, you are the first question, and, and speak up so we can hear you. Uh, may my question be directed to you rather than to oh, Valerie? Oh, please. I'm delighted you're here. Good, uh, and I'll be the conduit to your question. Back to her. Uh, I, I am proud to say that I think Marin is probably a step above most communities in terms of disaster preparedness. What do you think our state should do in terms of encouraging more communities to be more involved in disaster preparedness? All right, you and I are going to talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a great piece in the LA Times today, interestingly, on that topic, comparing San Francisco's efforts to Los Angeles efforts mm -hmm. on critical infrastructure, which I was part of. So it's a timely issue uh, and an incredibly powerful issue because it is <coughs> inevitable that one of these three faults, two of which are over a hundred years 
has to do in terms of uh, the next big quake. When it happens, that question will be profoundly even more significant. Sir? Yeah, um, I understand your, your answer and your concern about Pakistan. But I was wondering if you were underestimating North Korea. It's kind of, it always gets a cold. I was just wondering if, if it's more serious than, uh, than you. Did anyone hear that? Do you want me to repeat? If, Please repeat. Uh, if, if I was underestimating North Korea, always a mistake to do that. I, I, I don't mean to be glib in my remark. It's just that that always comes to mind whenever I see thousands of people holding up a colored placard, um, you know, with the, the, the dear leader uh, as his portrait. I just saw, I think yesterday it was reported, South Korea has reported that North Korea has restarted one of its uh, plutonium processing plants. Absolutely not to be undermined. Um, but I, uh, I find it, uh, they, they have probably 10 nuclear weapons, which is 10 too many for sure. Uh, but they are still scrambling very much. I mean, we had a crisis earlier this year. Uh, where they continue, they act like a spoiled child, and they're going to hold their breath and turn blue until you give them what they want. Uh, this, you know, press repeat. They do it again and again and again. Uh, so we, what I was pleased to see in this last iteration is that China, who is sort of the adult in the relationship, and they are the only ones that have leverage with them, has finally said, "This has got to stop. This is enough." What they are afraid of are millions and millions and millions of North Koreans streaming over their border. And then they go, now what? So they have to be careful. But they clearly showed more uh, urgency and more willingness to be engaged and to, to put a hand on North Korea to put them back. Um, but I just, I find it so creepy weird that they, you know, they've lost, I don't know, uh, over a million people due to starvation, um, and yet they still they have a nuclear capability. I mean, imagine that. Yeah, and I have faith in Ambassador Dennis Rodman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, comment on your book. It was very enjoyable and Thanks. kept me going. I missed a night's sleep, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't stop reading it. Uh, but Vanessa uh, seems to be effective only when she goes rogue. <laughs> she doesn't seem to ever be able to accomplish things going within the protocol. Mm -hmm. And when she goes outside the protocol, she's yeah. successful. Yeah. Is that a real world that you lived in? So the question was, uh, Vanessa seems to be successful only when she's able to go outside of protocol. Uh, and it, is that accurate? What I would say is this, the, the CIA carefully recruits the type of people that go into operations and it's this really fine balance of folks that are, uh, they go right to the edge. You don't, want to, you don't want to recruit those cowboys that are constantly going outside. That's really not useful. It is very harmful. Uh, and just a side point, the other thing I try to convey in the book, it really is a team effort. It's not a lone wolf out there. I mean, she, everyone brings to the table their own talent, from targeting to uh, technical stuff. But I would say that, uh, you know, she's still a young woman, still learning, still figuring out her moral compass, and, and it's all about judgment, which goes terribly awry at certain points, but uh, hopefully she's a quick learner. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Uh, Valerie, when you were out, and uh, you obviously pretty instantly lost your job, uh, did the CIA just say goodbye and good luck, or did they, or was it appropriate for me to ask, did they provide you with a pension or some means of support uh, for all your hard work over the years? The question was, what happened when I, uh, when my identity was betrayed? How did the CIA treat me? Um, I will tell you this. So uh, my identity was betrayed in July of 2003, and I resigned in 2007. And in that interval there, the total amount of time that I had with a senior CIA official 
was 10 minutes. And he spoke for eight of them. Um, so they really were, as a bureaucracy does, I do understand, they, they really were uh, under, they were not prepared. They don't, and I didn't expect anyone to hold my hand. I don't need anyone to hold my hand. <laughs> but you would have thought that they, someone would have come to me and said, you know, it's in our interest, in your interest, uh, here's how we should proceed. Uh, there was a time, let's see, it must have been, uh, yeah, 2004, and Joe's, Joe wrote a book, The Politics of Truth, and uh, he was getting a lot of attention and there was a lot of... Uh, <coughs> a lot of stuff being thrown at us. We were called liars and traitors, and I was accused of nepotism and so forth. At that same time, it was also a presidential election year, and I also learned that uh, there was a credible Al-Qaeda threat against me, and ironically, Karl Rove, George Tenet, and John Ashcroft. <laughs> all on the same. So I went to CIA, you know, head of security, and I said, Hey, I, uh, I'm, I'm worried about this, not for me, but I have young children. You know, as a parent, you will do anything to protect them. Uh, could you just look into this? So they, I can laugh now, but at the time it was devastating. They, look, they said, well, we, you know, no, we're not going to give you any protection. And the, the worst part was those other three that I mentioned already had, of course, 24-7 protection. Uh, and it felt like a betrayal all over again. So, uh, and no, I, I don't have a pension, which is why I'm writing books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir, way in the back. If I understand the question, I, I had a little trouble hearing who's like who has more points on the board between no, Iran who's, and who's most in the wrong in the activity yeah. between the U.S. and Iran. Oh, uh, <coughs> I think it's equally to blame. I mean, it's true. Uh, the CIA and the United States was deeply involved in ways it should not have been for the uh, for uh, to bring the Shah into power. Um, and, and throughout that whole period, I mean, how, you know, it's, it has been, this is why I'm a big proponent of diplomatic exchanges. You need to say, what is in your country's interest? What is in ours? Where do they, where's the Venn diagram where they overlap? Um, I, I really am heartened that we really maybe have a moment here. It can, it, it can happen where because of self-interest, which is realpolitik, that, e that nations can overcome a very bad history. It takes a while, but I think uh, some unbelievable, I don't have a number at my fingertips, but close to 50% of the population of Iran is under age 25. They are wearing jeans, they are tweeting, and uh, they very much want to be part of the rest of the the community of nations uh, in ways that is that still I don't think the Islamic Republic of Iran is going away. They don't want protests in the street, but uh, maybe we can find a way that bringing some stability to that region. Excuse me, ma'am, straight in the back. about two things. Uh, I know Scott Ritter, and I, I respect his work and what he spoke out against. 
if I under, if I heard correctly, he was saying that in his opinion, Iran's uh, nuclear program was just for peaceful use. I disagree profoundly. Um, secondly, yes, there is a double standard. You know what? Is it okay only for uh, Judeo-Christian countries to have this nuclear weapon, and for anyone else not? I mean, just trying to have that conversation with someone from the Muslim world. Uh, it doesn't make sense. I, and you're right, there is a double standard, which is why uh, the group I'm with, Global uh, uh, Advocate for Global Zero, is absolutely, this has got to be something that everyone's across the board, multilateral, deep inspections, and they have, it's not just so hold hands and, and feel good about it. These, it's, they're very serious people from Michael Douglas to Queen Noor to Gorbachev, uh, Tony Blair, Musharif, all these people are deeply involved in Global Zero. They would not be giving their time and energy unless they thought that they could really make a difference. And they are very serious and they have a very uh, orchestrated plan to go forward. Quick question, is that just what, what message are we sending in terms of what you perceive as the unilateral nature of our foreign policy in terms of intervention? I don't think we have time to come to <laughs> But we have time for, ma'am, your last question. Valerie, were there any times when you were covert that your neighbors, the Girl Scout leaders, anybody was like suspicious of <laughs> And are we, are we supposed to be, I mean, are we just supposed to buy that you're no longer in the CIA? <laughs> <laughs> are we just accept that? Because this is a kind of cover that I'm just saying is worthy of fiction. <laughs> Was that a no? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the, the, the truth is, uh, most people really want to talk about themselves, <laughs> right? And so, uh, uh, I never, despite what the narrative was put out there, uh, when the worst of this was going on, I could count on uh, one hand the people who knew where I actually worked. So uh, that's, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure the Girl Scout leader wasn't one of them. <laughs> uh, blow back the movie? I hope. <laughs>